What's up, YouTube? Brian here. Welcome back to 1517 Films, where in every episode, I'm always contending for the faith once for all delivered to the saints. And today, coming up on Trinity Sunday, we truly are going to contend for the faith. We're going to talk about the Athanasian Creed. Stick around. So many Christians of many denominations might know the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, yada, yada. Some might even know the Nicene Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible. You know, it, it goes on. Uh, very few know about the Athanasian Creed. And I think even fewer, those who do know about it, might not understand maybe the importance of saying it in church at least once a year. So in the church calendar, we are upon, we're coming up to Trinity Sunday. We've done the 50 days of Easter. We've done the Ascension. We just got done with Pentecost, the coming of the Holy Spirit, the birth of the church. But now we're on to Trinity Sunday, where the church historically, traditionally, has made confession of what she believes about the God she worships. That we worship one God. We are a monotheistic religion. And this one God is three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And we confess that the Father is God, that the Son is God, and that the Holy Spirit is is God. And yet in the words of the Athanasian Creed, we do not worship three gods, but one God. So in the early fourth century, there was uh, a heresy that arose, Arianism, that stated that Jesus was not divine. Jesus was not God. Now the church did respond very quickly to this from what we know from historical records with the Council of Nicaea. This is where we get the Nicaean Creed. Interesting fact about that is that most of those attending the Council of the Nicaea or the Council of Nicaea were Arians. But by the end of the Council of Nicaea and the writing and fleshing out fully of the Nicene Creed, the church was once again Trinitarian. So where some of our more oneness Pentecostal friends or, or crazy charismatics or even some evangelicals are going to come at us and say, well, look, 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 this council voted upon this doctrine. I suppose if you're a tinfoil hat wearing conspiracy theorist, you could see it that way. Or divine providence protected that which was always true in the face of almost insurmountable odds. So the Nicene Creed and the, and the uh, Apostles' Creed are very different. They start out by saying, I believe in God. The Athanasian Creed is very different. So let's take a look at this. Whoever desires to be saved must, above all, hold the Catholic faith. Whoever does not keep it whole and undefiled will, without doubt, perish eternally. Wow. So it's not, I believe, it's whoever wants to be saved must believe thus, must hold what? The Catholic faith. Now, Catholic is a good word. It's an ancient word. And it does not mean strictly Roman Catholic. It means the faith according to the whole. And what's nice is that the Athanasian Creed is going to lay out what the Catholic faith is. So if you're not Roman Catholic and you're looking at me going, you're not Roman Catholic either, Ryan. Why are you telling me to hold the Catholic faith? What is the Catholic faith? The according to the whole faith. The Catholic faith is this, that we worship one God in Trinity and Trinity in unity, neither confusing the persons nor dividing the substance. The Catholic faith is this, that we worship one God in Trinity and Trinity in unity, neither confusing the persons nor dividing the substance. So this is going to flesh out 
all of that. It, and it's got it's it's written in kind of a threefold way. It's got some bookends. So we've got the first book on whoever desires to be saved must above all hold the Catholic faith. And then at the very end, this is the Catholic faith. Whoever does not believe it faithfully and firmly cannot be saved. So in between these, this is the Catholic faith bookends, there is an explanation of each of the persons of the Trinity and a very special focus on the person and incarnation of Jesus Christ. Because Arianism was what? A denial that Jesus is God. Now, it's my opinion that at a base level intelligence, at a, with a base level intelligence, one can read the scriptures and clearly understand two things. If you read the Old Testament, you know unequivocally that there is one God. God says all the time that there he does not know any other gods, that there are no other gods. So, well, I'm sorry, but Mormonism is excluded. There are no other gods. There's some tongue-in-cheek reference in the Old Testament to other gods as a form of mockery. Oh, you who would think yourselves gods, well, but that's just ancient Mesopotamia. I mean, Pharaoh thought that he was a god. You know, lots of leaders in, in ancient Mesopotamia thought of themselves as gods, so kind of tongue-in-cheek, God would call them by that and then prove how they're not. So we definitively know from the Old Testament there is one God. And I think anyone with half a functioning brainstem could pull out of the New Testament, Jesus claimed to be God. He did it all the time. He did it with his I am statements. And I don't even think our English Bibles do us credit. As an example, um, when Jesus walks out onto the water and the disciples see him and they think it's a ghost and they, they're terrified and Jesus said, do not be afraid, it's me. He told them not to be afraid, but the exact Greek phrase, ego eimi, Jesus said, do not be afraid, I am. <laughs> When Jesus was challenged on whether or not he knew Abraham, he said, before Abraham was, I am. And now you've got other passages like I and the Father are one, not as clear cut as the, these I am statements. So, what do we do? Well, proper biblical exegesis is to filter the unclear passages through the clear passages. So we know, unequivocally, there's one God. Jesus says, I am the name given to Moses. And we also know that he says, I and my father are one. And we also see several examples of him talking about his father as a separate person. If you've seen me, you've seen the father. He also refers to the Holy Spirit as another person. He refers to him as the Comforter. Whom, Jesus says, I will send. So we, we, we see all of this in the Bible, that there's one God. We also see Jesus called the Son of God, calling himself God, referring to his Father and the Holy Spirit as distinct persons yet all the while maintaining that there is one God. We see at Jesus' baptism, Jesus physically present in the water, the Holy Spirit descending and resting on him as a dove, and the Father speaking, This is my beloved Son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Is that a cheap parlor trick? So, when we just read the Bible at a base level and let it say what it says, it's unequivocally clear that this one God is composed of three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And these three persons are actually introduced to us right away in the beginning. In the beginning, God created the, created the heavens and the earth. The earth was with out form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters, and God said... Let there be light. And there was light. So we have the Father, the Holy Spirit, and the Son 
Go to the beginning of the Gospel of John and you'll understand why God said is the first appearance of Christ in the, in the Old Testament because Jesus is the Word made flesh. And the original Hebrew for the first verse of the Bible, Bereshit bara Elohim, et hashemayim et haeretz, Elohim is plural. But Elohim is the word for God. But a plural form of that word is used... So, in the beginning, he, gods, created the heavens and the earth. But we know that God created the heavens and the earth. And then, this we, we get snippets all throughout the scriptures of divine conversation. If I were to ask you, whose image is mankind after? Whose image were we made in? Gods. Were we made in the image of angels? No. Were we made in the image of, of any created thing or any uh, created being? No, we were created in the image of God. And God said, let us make man after our image and in our likeness. Or when God said to Isaiah, whom shall I send and who will go for us? Or when three persons approached Abraham and he fell to his knees and said, my God, singular, so the Athanasian Creed, is, it lays this all out. And it might seem a bit redundant, but it's ever so important. I'll give you an example of redundancy. For the Father is one person, the Son is another, and the Holy Spirit is another. But the Godhead of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit is one. The glory equal, the majesty co-eternal. Such as the Father is, such is the Son, and such is the Holy Spirit. The Father uncreated, the Son uncreated, the Holy Spirit uncreated. The Father infinite, the Son infinite, the Holy Spirit infinite. The Father eternal, the Son eternal, the Holy Spirit eternal. And yet there are not three eternals, but one eternal. Just as there are not three uncreated or three infinites, but one uncreated and one infinite. And it goes on. It's, it's over-redundant in its explanation of what God is and what God is not, and who God is, and who he is not. And of course, a brilliant explanation of who Christ is. And it, it, this, this statement, I love this, just as we are compelled by the Christian truth to acknowledge each distinct person as God and Lord, so also are we prohibited by the Catholic religion to say there are three gods or three lords. So no, my Muslim friends, we do not believe in three gods, we believe in one. This important distinction, the Father is not made nor created nor begotten by anyone. The Son is neither made nor created but begotten of the Father alone. The Holy Spirit is of the Father and of the Son, neither made nor created nor begotten but proceeding. So the role of each, they're all eternal, they're all uncreated, they are all equal in substance, in glory, in majesty. But the Son is different because he's begotten of the Father. And the Holy Spirit is different because he proceeds from the Father and the Son. And then we get to Jesus. Where is Jesus? Where is he? Okay, but, so, therefore, whoever desires to be saved must think thus about the Trinity. This is the right faith, to think that there are three persons, one God. But it is also necessary for everlasting salvation that one faithfully believe the incarnation of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, it is the right faith that we believe and confess that our Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, is at the same time both God and man. He is God, begotten from the substance of the Father before all ages, and he is man, born from the substance of his mother in this age. Perfect God and perfect man, composed of a rational soul and human flesh, equal to the Father with respect to his divinity, less than the Father with respect to his humanity. Although he is God and man, he is not two, but one Christ." One, however, not by the conversion of the divinity into flesh, but by the assumption of the humanity into God, 
one altogether, not by confusion of substance, but by unity of person. For as the rational soul and flesh is one man, so God and man is one Christ. And then it lays out everything that this God-man did for our salvation. Is Jesus man? Yes, he certainly is. There are several references to Jesus' humanity throughout the New Testament. But there are all, there's also, and it, it's so beautiful, and what a verse of comfort it is, that the Bible would say, one of the apostles would say, that God shed his blood. That is a statement that is in the New Testament. God shed his blood. Thomas, uh, on the eighth day after the resurrection, seeing Jesus fell down and worshipped him and said, My Lord and my God. And Jesus received the worship. We see Jesus doing that, don't we? Receiving worship. Now, some of my oneness Pentecostal friends have said, Ryan, the finite cannot contain the infinite. Ergo, uh, God cannot step into human form because humanity itself by nature cannot contain it. It's cool that you put God in a box like that. But what does the creed confess? And this is why the creed is important to us, because it gives us the language to speak. While I can say, yes, the finite cannot contain the infinite, borrowing the language of the Athanasian Creed, I can say the infinite can contain the finite. Jesus became man, not by zapping a human into God, but by taking humanity into himself, embracing humanity into who he is. He assumed humanity. He did not impose on human flesh. So yes, the infinite was contained in the finite, in the person of Jesus Christ. And well, that's why he's God, because I can't do that. I can't can't be God and man at the same time. And then, of course... Now, for Lutherans, Lutherans, here's where where our problem seems to be with the Athanasian Creed, right there at the end. Uh, So it talks about him coming back. Uh, At his coming, all people will rise again with their bodies and give an account concerning their own deeds. And this is where Lutherans have a problem. And those who have done good will enter into eternal life, and those who have done evil into eternal fire. There's a phrase, a a series of words, two words, that make Lutherans just go, those words are works righteousness. We do not believe, teach, or confess that we are saved or justified or enter into eternal paradise by any works, worthiness, or merit in us. But the Catholic faith is this. Whoever wishes to be saved must keep it whole, and undefiled. So Lutherans, we have to deal with these words. I suppose our Roman Catholic friends would look at him and go, see, the ancient church always confessed works. Well, the New Testament, Jesus, Jesus says that the only true good work is to believe in him. And we know that's a gift. No one can say Jesus is Lord unless by the Holy Spirit. So we know that's a gift. And believing in Jesus Christ is the only true good work. We do know that our good works are going to follow us. Revelation says as much. Jesus assures us that there are going to be two groups of people at the judgment, those who plead their good works before him, and Jesus says, depart from me, I didn't know you, and those to whom Jesus tells their good works, and they look at him and go, well, when did we do that? So what this means is from right faith, flows right works. A Christian does good works because they are a Christian. And these good works come to the Christian by faith, as a gift of God, as Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, and 10 would say that they are prepared for us that we should walk in them. So we don't even get to take credit for these good works. They're not ours, they're God's, and he gives them to us that we should walk in them. Because of Christ's perfect obedience in his life, suffering, and death, 
credited and uh, accepted by God as evidenced by his resurrection, our good works are good enough. Not because we do them, but because Christ says they are. Because he says, my works are good enough. I gave these works to these people. Look at them, do them. But those who do not do good, those who do evil, they will enter into eternal fire. Uh, and and even people, there are, there are people. Let's be honest, that are not Christians that do incredible works, very very good works on this earth, have advanced mankind and cared for and loved and served their neighbor. But when perfection and righteousness is not credited to you, whatever good works you do, what does the Bible say of them? In God's sight, they're filthy rags. Eve, are, we are so evil to our core. That even our good works are like filthy menstrual rags to God. When we have been redeemed, and all of creation has been redeemed, we have been redeemed, our good works have been redeemed, and because of the suffering, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, then and only then do good works become pleasing to God, because the whole of the person has been redeemed and justified. And declared righteous. And so God accepts the good work of the Christian because those good works are covered by the blood of his son and declared righteous. God does not accept good works of the sinner and the unrepentant because those good works have not been washed in the blood of the Lamb. So this uh, Athanasian rambling is going to wrap up. So I'm going to do a couple of things. I used to be a co-host for a podcast called The Gospel Asylum, and we put out a video uh, of the Athanasian Creed. Uh, link to that in the description below. I highly recommend you watch that. It's, you know, you're reading these great and ancient words with the modern melody of holy, holy, holy behind it. So check that out. I'm going to put a link into the description below of an uh, interview of Pastor Chris Roseborough of Fighting for the Faith. Uh, this is done by another channel, but he was interviewed, and he spends an hour, I think, laying out the biblical evidence for how we know that God is triune, how we know that Jesus is God, and he even addresses some heresy concerning the Holy Spirit. So these are all incredible resources. So in closing, I just want to say the Athanasian Creed is very important. Very important. It is a part of our history, collectively, regardless of denomination, our history and heritage. This creed belongs to us. This creed lays out in no unclear terms what we believe. At the same time, it makes a solid confession of what we believe. It also understands mystery. This creed does not say how God is three persons in one God, only the reasons we know why he is. The problem, and where heresy creeps in, is when we try to understand a mystery. We as Christians just need to be able to sometimes embrace mystery. Does the Bible say God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? Absolutely it does. Do we know how he is? Nope. Why? Because he did not reveal that to us. He revealed to us in his word that he is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and he is one God. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. There is one God. But he unequivocally reveals himself as three persons. And he never says why. Or never says how. That's his prerogative. He's God. But I think, in my final thought, a God that can be comprehended fully is no God at all. If a finite being can fully comprehend the infinite, then that infinite isn't infinite. Let God be God and every man a liar. He doesn't tell us how, just that. He is. Be still and know that I am God, he says. Until next time, may God richly bless you in the grace and mercy won for you by Jesus' vicarious death on the cross for all of your sins.